Hello, everyone, and welcome to the NASDAQ Dorsey Wright Podcast. I'm Ian Saunders. And I'm Eric McArdle. And it is Wednesday, February 12th here. Uh, so kicking things off this morning with uh, domestic equity indexes pretty much across the board continuing uh, to creep higher. Um, after we got some new all-time highs yesterday, the S&P 500 uh, moved to an all-time high on its default chart there at 3370. Um, so continuing to rally after a brief, pretty brief period of, of uncertainty that we saw going on and then um, several consecutive days of, of um, move uh, upward movement here, uh, moving back to that all-time high, but also creeping back in a slightly overbought territory. Um, we're seeing the, the S&P 500 index is at a weekly overbought oversold reading of 78% through trading yesterday. Um, and some of the areas that are leading the market higher, your, your technology really in um, in, in uh, particular there is, is creeping, some of the names are creeping back up uh, towards overbought territory as well. Um, but there are some other areas in the market that we've been keeping an eye on here recently that uh, might not be so overbought. Is that right, Eric? Yeah, yeah. On the other end of the spectrum, Ian, in fact, heavily oversold are the energy names, right? And this is no surprise given the technical weakness that's been displayed by energy as a sector um, really leading up, you know, in the past couple of years. Um, however, when we look under the hood, you know, we have somewhat of a catalyst for this recent weakness. Um, crude oil has broken down recently, right? So we've seen on the chart for CL forward slash, the crude oil continuous commodity chart on the Dorsey Ride platform, broke a spread quintuple bottom at 50 here recently, uh, about a week ago. So mm-hmm. crude oil in a bear market right now, meaning it was down uh, 20% or more. And when we look at, say, the, the, the domestic equity representatives for the energy space, looking at XLE, the Spider Sector Energy Fund, down almost 10% on the year. So mm-hmm. and we talked about the strength of the market, the strength of technology, right? The S&P 500, as of yesterday's close, up about 4% on the year. So really divergent from that energy space. Um, however... When we look on the Dorsey Wright platform and we look at some of the ideas in energy, we see some surprising names, right? We see some of the green energy uh, participants, whether that's solar, wind, anything clean energy, scoring very, very well mm-hmm. and heavily overbought in many cases. But you know, there's a number of funds that are in that in that idea section of either Dolly or asset class group scores that are near a perfect six fund score. So. You know, a lot of strength in that kind of specialized area of the energy market, but mm-hmm. still not enough to really propel the broader sector. Absolutely. I mean, and you mentioned the uh, the divergence that we've seen there. I mean, we've seen from the just from the sector perspective with technology at the front versus energy at the bottom, um, a, a lot of dis, uh, dispersion there. And then, as you mentioned, within energy in and of itself, I mean, uh, clean energy, most of those clean energy funds are going to be over 100% overbought that we're seeing there. A lot of, um, I guess, hype around the ESG mm-hmm. area uh, recently um, at, at, in the start of 2020 here. But then you look at like the some oil-related companies. Right, we have the um, 40 DWA sectors here on the platform, and uh, two of those are going to be oil related. So the bullish percent for oil that we've seen has reversed down into a column of those at the end of um, last month, uh, continued to um, levels at 24 percent right now. So, mm-hmm. and what that means is the bullish percent uh, charts that we have on the platform are going to be looking at a basket of securities and identifying how many of those securities or what percentage of those securities are on a current uh, point and figure buy signal. And so, currently for the oil related stocks that we have on the platform. Only 24% of stocks that we classify as oil-related companies are on a current buy signal there. Um, And that's the lowest number for any of the 40 groups that we have on the platform. However, it's not the lowest number for that indicator in the past year. Um, I mean, that, that indicator is at 24%. It was at 22% in October. It was actually all the way down at 12% in August of last year. Hmm. Um, so just because we've seen a lot of the, the fall in oil over the past several months doesn't mean it won't necessarily continue lower. Um, so definitely, if you're looking for uh, looking for an area to keep an eye on in the energy space, that clean energy route is probably going to be the, the, the place to go there, as you mentioned. Definitely. And great points on the BPC. And, and if you are waiting for energy to have you know some kind of hopeful turnaround here. Uh, rather than having a hope, watch for the BP reversal up into X's from mm-hmm. below that 30% threshold. Um, so something to monitor if you are watching that space. Yeah. And, and we talk about clean energy, Ian. You know, we look at the E in ESG, right? The environmental aspect in many cases, um, sustainable maybe a little bit as well. And then the governance is the final component. And we're looking 
for other names that are perhaps in that same vein. Um, on asset class group scores, we have the social responsibility group, mm -hmm. uh, which is scoring very well, uh, 3.93 fund score for the group, which is just shy of that optimal 4.0 positive score direction, and as a group, a low R risk, right? It's an R risk of 0.89, and that R risk is looking at relative standard deviation or relative volatility against the S&P 500, so a little bit lower volatility, um, which may be not surprising given the exclusion of a lot of the traditional energy names that have lagged yeah. um, and, and had a lot of volatility here in recent months. So that's an area to check, um, you know, as, as we mentioned, for any of those ESG or clean energy ideas in addition to the energy ideas as Absolutely. well. Absolutely. I mean, that, talk about consistency. And that group moved above a, an average score of 3.5 there in March of last year and has really just moved kind of straight sideways, steadily creeping higher. It's been one of the most consistently higher scoring groups that we've seen there on the platform mm -hmm. um, that goes a, a little bit under the radar. Obviously, ESG is very popular, um, but in terms of identifying group movement and whatnot, it does tend to fly a little bit under the radar there. So yep. um, definitely a point to, to keep an eye on and also keeping an eye for maybe some pullbacks or price normalizations because, as you mentioned there, a lot of those areas are going to be pretty, uh, pretty heavily overbought. Um, some other movement that we've seen going on here recently um, on the on the Dolly page really is uh, it's on the international front. Mm -hmm. um, we've seen over the past week there um, a couple changes to the um, international regional breakdown on that Dolly page. Uh, so with Europe emerging Europe emerging space that kind of maintained that number one. Uh, that number one position on Dolly, but then Europe developed, uh, moved up a little bit over the past week. Is that right? Yeah, it did. And, and so this is the first time now since 2013 that the top two spots in the international Dolly rankings are held by European equities, right? So as Ian mentioned, emerging firmly in that number one spot, whereas developed um, um, European equities have moved into the number two spot. And we look at what's driving the emerging side really heavily propelled by Russia, which has been a strong group for the past, boy, I, what, 18 months maybe mm -hmm. or so? I mean, it, it's been at the top of asset class group scores quite consistently, has pulled back a little bit, um, still an optimal group score of 4.51, so very strong there. And when we look at the developed aspect, you know, we've talked a little bit in our, not only in our, our communications to you all via the podcast, um, but also in our research about developed equities holding up pretty well, right, on, the, on a uh, relative basis against their emerging market counterparts over the past few months. And looking at those European names, such as the UK, right, we've had um, some of the other countries, France actually looks pretty decent. And combining all of those into an ETF, say with the Spider Portfolio Europe ETF, ticker SPEU, returned to a buy signal in October of last year with a double top and has moved up consistently since then, uh, moving to a positive trend, going past multiple levels of resistance, and now is situated with a fund score of 3.35 and a positive score direction of 1.44. So a lot of strength there in the European developed market space. Um, so interesting to see, right? We haven't had this in a while. Mm -hmm. A lot of the, the major talk about you know equity growth, especially abroad, has been centered on Asia. Um, so don't sleep on Europe, right? The technicals say not to. Yeah, so keep absolutely. an eye on that. I mean, we've continued to see that that developed uh, space outperform the emerging space throughout much uh, much of the start of this year. We saw a little bit of pickup in emerging markets in the in the fourth quarter of 2019, and then um, the developed markets kind of looped uh, overtook that that um, top spot again to start off the year. But that doesn't mean there aren't areas in emerging markets that are still looking pretty solid. And surprisingly enough, to to some of you, the, um, China the several areas within Chinese equities are actually continuing to maintain strength even with all the uncertainty. Around around the, the coronavirus coming out of the, the country there. I mean, looking specifically at the China healthcare um, space has been one of the more um, consistent rallies that we've seen over the past couple months here. Um, representative there, Crane Shares, All China Healthcare Index Fund, KURE. Um, you're looking at three consecutive buy signals on that chart. It bounced off its, its uh, bullish support line there in August of last year, um, rallied to a new 52-week high, um, and it's up almost 10% on the year, mm -hmm. uh, which is, if you're just following the headlines in the news, you might might not think that uh, many areas within Chinese equities are going to be up 10%. Yeah. Um, but another as well, I mean, the internet space too. Um, if we were talking a little bit right before happened on the happened on the uh, the podcast here that. Um, 
potentially some of the e-commerce areas that are looking around there, I guess with maybe more people in their beds, you might get some more sales on some of those sites, might boost some of the, um, the, the in, in, in Chinese internet stocks higher. Uh, but looking at the Invesco China Technology ETF CQQQ, um, also a pretty significant outperformance this year, up almost 7%, um, reversed back up into a column of X's right at the end of January and has continued higher here in February. Um, you look at an average or a fund score for CQQQ of 5.68 with a score direction of 5.57. Wow. Uh, that's, it's not very often you see that high of a score <laughs> direction. I guess maybe not as surprising with the um, China kind of growth focused fund there, uh, but definitely an interesting place to watch out uh, for, especially since over the next couple weeks, we have a lot of these uh, big, larger Chinese uh, technology companies that are coming out with their earnings releases. Um, so maybe potentially changing forward guidance, but definitely an area to keep an eye on um, as we head down the next couple couple weeks of earnings season for sure. Absolutely, and you know, in that same vein, Ian, we look at the emerging market bond space, which has done very well recently. Um, so you know, all that to say. Sometimes the headlines, which can can obviously trigger emotions or you know a certain sentiment in either way, um, we always want to make sure that we reconcile that with the technical picture. And in this case, you know we found some surprising developments. So, you know emerging market bonds uh, again scoring pretty well as a group. Also moving into a couple of our models, and we mentioned on our FSM update last week that emerging market bonds moved into the Franklin fixed income model, and also we saw FEMB. Uh, move into the first trust fixed income model, and that actually occurred at the end of January. So, you know, kind of early in this coronavirus phase. So, you've had strength in that area of the bond market since then in that first trust model. Yeah, absolutely, that's wonderful. Um, so, on that first trust note, you mentioned there are some of the first trust models. We did want to bring to y'all's attention as well as we're um, wrapping up the podcast here that we have opened up registration for our spring 2020 Point and Figure Institute, uh, which is going to be held April 23rd and 24th in uh, in Las Vegas at the Encore at Wynn Hotel there. Um, so, then it's going to be sponsored in part by First Trust, uh, one of the premium sponsors that we have there. Um, it, it's a great way, uh, kind of, to come and learn more about the platform regardless of your, your skill level with the platform. Right? Um, it's good if you're a, a beginner there, we're going to have a variety of educational content coming out in the weeks before the Institute to bring you up to speed and make sure you get the most out of the next couple uh, those couple days of the event there. Um, and also, if you've been a long-time user, um, that we're always trying to come out with new things, new areas on the platform, new strategies, new, new ways to apply the uh, kind of point-and-figure technical analysis that we do here at NASDAQ Dorsey Wright um, and try to bring, bring that to you as much as possible there uh, in person at the event. Um, and it's also a great networking opportunity. So, I mean, there's going to be almost 100 advisors there that use the NASDAQ Dorsey Wright platform, and everyone's going to use it in different ways, right? No one's going to no one's going to be doing everything exactly the same. And so also just in coming there and speaking with other individuals might give you something to take back to your practice that you, you wouldn't have necessarily thought about there. So... Yep, and and you definitely have to take those skills home because uh, you might be losing money at the blackjack table, right? <laughs> so hopefully not. Uh, uh, Vegas isn't a bad place to be. Either, not at all. Sure. Not at all. So great. Well, with that, Ian, I think we've we've about covered it for today and this week. And for you all, thanks for listening. We'll talk to you next week.